the book of Joel, which is our kind of next book here in the Minor Prophets, arguably starting with, with Obadiah as the earliest writing prophet. Um, we now kind of see the building of the theology of the Minor Prophets uh, through some added dimensions in Joel. And we'll talk about Joel specifically. But remember, these, these minor prophets are, are put together. Okay? Are, they, they write independently. They each contribute something unique. That being said, they, they play off each other. So they're, they're a building kind of theology within them. Yeah. Can I get my Bible? Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, Obadiah, his big theme, you know, he takes the opportunity to talk about a present and near future situation, but um, Obadiah's main, you know, kind of big thing that he contributes is what? What's kind of Obadiah's um, big thing that he, he lays as a coming reality for uh, the world in Obadiah 15? What was that we looked at yesterday? So Obadiah, yes, let me see. Um, the day of Yahweh. The day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord. Okay, so that's Obadiah's kind of major like contribution that he reveals that others will build off of. Okay, and he says, look, <clears throat> Edom is going to participate um, in this fight against Israel at a certain point. When Israel goes into exile, um, Edom is going to take advantage of that and not help them. And they think that they've overthrown what God has said. God said that the older will serve the younger, that Edom would serve Israel. But it looks like God's promises have failed. Well, Obadiah says, no, God's going to judge Edom very severely um, and bring vengeance on them <clears throat> relative to Israel. Okay, God's going to work and, and judge on behalf of his people. But then he says, this is just a preview of God's coming judgment, not just of Edom, but of all the nations in the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh. Okay? So he says, the day of the Lord draws near on all nations, and the result of the day of the Lord will be that God will use Israel to judge the nations. He will make them like a fire and everybody else like hay. Uh, and he says, Basically, the result of the day of the Lord will be the completion of the conquest. All the land will be given to Israel that was promised to Abraham. And then Obadiah 21 concludes with, and the kingdom will be the Lord's, meaning God's visible physical kingdom will be shown, will be manifested on uh, the earth. And this is connected with um, the Messiah, because if you recognize the phrase, the kingdom will be the Lord's, that comes from Psalm 22, which talks about the Messiah's uh, work in suffering the curse of God um, and then br bringing about victory in God's kingdom. Okay. Now, Joel, <clears throat> let's see if you guys can infer. Uh, I think I may have mentioned this a little yesterday, but let's see if you guys can kind of guess where Joel is headed. Joel says, okay, Israel, the day of the Lord, it is true what Obadiah has said, the day of the Lord is going to be judgment on all nations, but Israel, you need to be aware what? Can you guys kind of see where he's going to go with this? Israel, I know you that the day of the Lord is going to judge the nations, but it's also what? Yeah. Going to judge them. It's also going to judge them. Yeah. So that, that's what Joel contributes is he says, the great and terrible day of the Lord is coming to judge God's people as well as the nations. Therefore, if God's people are not repentant, that they will be swept away in the judgment of the day of the Lord as well. Okay. So while they're going to celebrate that God is going to judge the nations, um, and in a sense, that is good. He is going to uh, judge his own people, too. And uh, so that's what we see in the book of Joel, okay? Um, Joel, his name <coughs> means Yahweh is powerful, Yael. Uh, Yahweh is powerful, okay, is his name. And remember, the names of the prophets play into their writings. They play into their theology. Okay, so that's what Joel's name means. He probably writes, I put him at the time, about 835 BC, okay, a little after Obadiah. He doesn't mention any kings. He just mentions priests. So he's probably during this time of a young king named Joash 
who is crowned king at a very young age, but isn't able to take the throne. And the priests kind of administrate and rule until Joash is old enough. And so that's one evidence of kind of the time period that Joel is written in. Okay, and Joel is writing because there is a very devastating um, situation that has happened to Israel that's basically stripped them bare, destroyed their economy, threatened them with starvation, and that situation is, uh, in Joel chapter 1, a locust plague. Locust plague. Okay. Now, we have um, locust plagues. I know we don't have locust plagues. We have locusts out here. We have grasshoppers. Locusts are a little bit different. We do have them out in the desert, but they're not quite what you'd get from like the ancient Near East and like kind of the Middle East and stuff. Um, locusts can be like this big. Um, if you guys have seen, it wasn't that good, but like the new Jurassic Park that has those big locusts, like they're like, oh, they're like genetically modifying them in the movie. They can be that big. Um, they're, they're huge. Uh, uh, animals at certain points. I guess they're not animals; they're insects. But whatever. And um, they, what you may have seen uh, locusts in movies like um, The Mummy. Um, have you guys seen The Mummy? No, but I've been on the Universal. Movie. Okay. Well, that one doesn't have the locusts in it. But uh, but it's a good movie. You guys should uh, should watch it. It still it still holds up. And it's funny. And it's uh, it's a good action movie. Um, also, there was a movie uh, Hidalgo that had the you know this guy in a horse race out in you know uh, the Middle East somewhere. I don't remember what state. It was maybe Iran, and uh, it's the guy who plays Aragorn in Lord of the Rings racing on his horse. And uh, he uh, at one point sees a locust plague, um, and so what happens there is these these uh, locusts. Giant grasshoppers <clears throat> block out the sun with like a cloud of so many of them, and they cover everything. Okay, so that's not only gross, it's not only creepy, but what you have to understand is locusts um, eat everything. They eat everything. Okay, so whatever food, whatever's there, like a locust plague in like a farming agrarian economy is super devastating because it leads to lack of food, starvation, you know, poverty, and there's nothing you can really do about it once it's happened. Um, <clears throat> and they don't even just eat the like food, like fruit off the vine. They'll eat the leaves. So it's like they eat up everything that is there and leave it totally like bare. Um, during <clears throat> during COVID a few years ago, Africa, certain areas of Africa had locust plagues. And I remember a friend of mine was like posting on Facebook. He's like, "What is it? We've got like pestilence. We've got you know locusts. This is like God's judgment." And in a sense, he was right. But <clears throat> But yeah, other places of the world still experience those. But let me just kind of put it to you this way. Um, now, we, we don't live and exist in, you know, doors and windows are, are a little tighter now. And uh, we have a little bit of a different uh, set of structure with our houses. But let me just put it this way. If this room got filled with locusts who were in here, they would eat up, like, the drapes. They would eat up, like, the strings on the window. They would eat up, like, the cloth you know, stuff hanging on the wall. They would eat up like the paper. <clears throat> they would eat up like all the little like stuff in the trash can. They would, yeah, clothes. They would, they would eat through like every bit of this, uh, of this room. You just the, just the hard stuff would be left. Okay. So they chew on everything. Okay. So Israel had this happen to them. And Joel says, <clears throat> okay, Israel, this is your wake up call. Uh, and he literally says that. He says, awake, O drunkards, basically, at this point. And so he says, uh, this is your wake-up call to repent, to get right with God, because he says, look, if you think this plague from God is bad, it's going to pale in comparison to the great and terrible day of the Lord. Okay, so he says God's real judgment is coming. This is devastating, but God's final judgment will be even greater when God directly judges. Okay, so, um, and then for Israel, keep in mind <clears throat> that plagues and stuff like this, locusts, uh, they're not random, right? What book, there's actually two books, but I think one will be kind of more sufficient to answer this. What book informs them that, um, that these different plagues and punishments are not random, but they come from God? Yeah. 
Uh, either Deuteronomy or yeah, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, yeah. De Leviticus 26 also informs that, but Deuteronomy 27 28 say that um, if you obey God, you'll get what? Well, blessings, and if you disobey God, the result will be curses. Yeah, so this is a curse of the law. And so what <clears throat> Joel is warning of them about during this time of the divided kingdom, it says, hey guys, you need to take notice of this and wake up, because he says, this is coming to you from God, and he goes, the, the curses of the law will intensify, and if you continue to disobey God and not repent, God will eventually do what? What's kind of the big final consequence relative to Israel and the land? Think Assyria, think Babylon. What's the big one that comes? Exile. Exile, getting kicked out of the land. And so Joel says, hey, look, bigger consequences are coming. And then the biggest one is day of the Lord, day of Yahweh. Okay. Um, can somebody read <coughs> uh, Joel 1.4? Joel 1 4. Let's start with, uh, let's start with Eli. Like the first. <laughs> what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroyed locust has eaten. Okay, so I think you guys pick up on that there. There's a locust that comes and he just kind of, he eats and then he kind of chews on stuff. And then there's a locust group that swarms and then they eat after whatever that guy left behind. And then after that swarm moves on, there's a creeping locust, a guy who kind of just wanders around afterward and eats up whatever he can find that's left over. And then after the creeping locust, there's a locust that strips everything that's left. Okay, so you, there's like four different stages here. So this is like complete um, like destruction as far as what the locusts leave behind. There's nothing. Okay, And so this is very like... Uh, serious judgment from God. And so uh, Joel says <clears throat> from God, because he says this is the word of the Yahweh, uh, he says, Awake, drunkards, and weep, and wail, you wine drinkers, on account of the sweet wine that is cut off from your mouth. Now he says, look, grapes are gone, crops are gone, now the, the grain is gone, the uh, stuff that you would use to feed the livestock, you can't feed yourselves and you can't feed your animals that you'd use for livestock. But also, God commanded in the law to offer grain offerings and offer animal sacrifices. And so now God has cut off their worship from him and their sacrificial system and said, hey, look, you're not even able to be obedient to the law now. And, and offer these sac uh, sacrifices. So it's time for everybody to wake up re and repent. Okay? And so uh, Joel 1.13, he says, gird yourselves with sackcloth. In other words, cover yourself with this garment that shows that you're mourning. And he says, and lament, O priests, wail, O ministers of the altar. Come and spend the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God, for your grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Meaning they can't even offer what they're supposed to offer uh, anymore. So he calls the priests to weep. He calls the people to weep. And then in Joel 1.14, he tells them to fast, okay, um, or to, to consecrate a fast. What is, uh, what is fasting? in the Bible, but outside of Vivian, yeah. Um, like an extended period of time where you're not allowing yourself to eat. Yeah, it's a, it's a withholding, it's a restraint from uh, food, where you focus, basically the idea of fasting in the Bible <clears throat> is that there's an intensity of a situation, usually involving repentance and prayer, that, um, that basically you focus so much on repentance and prayer, you're not like, you know, I better like go uh, make some time to eat and not focus on this right now. That the situation is that dire that you're like, okay, eating's not the priority right now. Repentance and prayer and um, going before God is the priority right now. So uh, they tell, he says uh, in Joel 1.14, consecrate a, a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, uh, and uh, gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of Yahweh, to the temple, house of Yahweh your God, and cry uh, out to the Lord. Okay, so <clears throat> now uh, can somebody read uh, Joel 1.15? Joel 1.15? Okay, Eli, I read. Alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is near, and the destruction from the Almighty it comes. Okay, so now we have 
Joel says, look, you guys need to repent because of the current circumstances, but also look to the future because the day of the Lord, the day of Yahweh, is near. Okay? And the, he calls it destruction from the Almighty is coming. Okay? So um, this is where we get a key next step of development of this idea of the day of Yahweh. And he also uses this word near, right? Which, remember, we discussed doesn't mean near temporally. It doesn't mean near in time. It means that this is kind of the big next guaranteed stop as far as where all history is heading. Okay, so this is like, the, the idea of nearness, another way to put it, is inescapable, right? It's like you're on, um, it's like you're on a train and this, you have stops that are scheduled along the way. And uh, this is kind of like, all right, here's this goal that everything's headed towards. So when it says the day of the Lord is near, doesn't mean in time, it means in significance. It means that God's day is the big, big picture where all the nations are going to have to face this, um, this judgment. Okay, so that's what he, he's warning them about. He says, you need to repent because the day of the Lord is uh, near. Okay, so then he tells them, look, all your stuff shriveled up. Your barns are torn down. Your grain is dried up. Your animals are, are starving. They're walking around aimlessly. He says, this is time to <clears throat> repent. Then in Joel 2, 1, he says, blow a trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. Then he says again, for the day of the Lord is coming. Surely it is near. Now listen how he describes the day of the Lord. A day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And this is the type of cloud that God comes in, uh, which in the Old Testament, when you have a supernatural cloud, only God arrives in the clouds. That will be important for Daniel. Uh, then he says, and uh, as the dawn is spread over the mountains, so there is a great and mighty people, uh, there will never be anything like it, nor will there again be uh, after it, uh, nor uh, to the years and the many generations. So he talks about God is going to bring judgments against Israel. He's going to bring armies and war chariots and all these things against Israel. Um, he's going to bring earthquakes, the heavens are going to tremble, the moon is going to grow dark, the stars are going to lose their brightness. Now he says God's going to bring all these judgments, not just against the nations, Obadiah, but against God's people, Israel as well. Because they're not immune, if they haven't repented, if they're not right with God, they won't be protected uh, in the day of the Lord. Okay, so that's what, so they're going to go through a very severe uh, judgment as well, which Jeremiah calls the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay, so it's God will preserve and save some of his people, but they're going to go through a very severe judgment. Um, and it basically, he says, yes, there are going to be other pagan nations that are going to come against Israel, but he says, ultimately, their general is me. Ultimately, their general is God. Uh, can somebody read Joel uh, 2.11? Uh, yeah, Vivian. <coughs> Hotel to eleven. <laughs> the Lord, the Lord utters His voice before His army, for His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes His word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Okay, thank you. So He says here that God is the one ultimately. These armies are doing their part, but God is ultimately the one giving orders. The Lord utters His voice before his army. It's his camp. And then he carries out his word. And then he says the day of Yahweh is, um, the, another way to put this is the great and terrible day of Yahweh. Here it puts it as great and very awesome. Awesome biblically can be, it can be good, it can be praiseworthy. It means something that fills you with awe. But it's also connected in English with our word awful, okay? Which we say, okay, that's awful, which is something that's bad. Um, but, but the kind of older use used to talk about the awful majesty of God, which means it's, it's good and bad. It's good in the sense of God is great, but God is also terrifying in his, um, in his greatness. So if you're right with God, it's great. It's cool. It's, it's, uh, it fills you with awe. If you're not, it's, you know, it's terrifying. 
And so this is what the idea of is, it's not that just, you know, God's awesome, like he's cool. This is that God is um, great and terrible in the sense that he is um, overwhelming in his judgment, right? If God is the general on the other side, that means you're going to lose, okay? But the good news is there's a change here in Joel 2.12. Okay, there's a change here in Joel 2.12 where he talks about, and this is a key part of the book, is Joel defines for us really what repentance is and what repentance looks like. It's, pre, it's in other parts of scripture as well, but Joel really illustrates for us uh, kind of the nature of biblical repentance. And this will play into the New Testament as well um, when they're called to repent they'll often reference uh, Joel. So, um, somebody uh, who wants to read uh, Joel 2.12. Yeah, Patrick? Yeah, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Okay, so now God says, yet even now, at the point of judgment, He doesn't say, just here's judgment, you're going to lose, it's going to be terrible, and that's just it. He says, yet even now repent, okay? Turn to me. So when you see in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, turn or return, it's connected, just know it's it's connected with the idea of the word we call uh, repentance, okay? Which means sometimes I think we undersell repentance a little bit or underestimate exactly what repentance is um, because we say it's a change of mind. That's what it, it, yeah, that's true, but it's more of a change of mindset, a change of attitude that admits God is right. I am wrong. I am deserving of God's judgment. I confess that God is right. I admit my sin before him. I want to turn from my sin and turn to God. And I admit everything that God judges, everything that God says is correct. And I I reject my sin. I want to reject my bad thinking, my bad attitude that led me into sin and turn to God. That's what uh, that's what repentance is, as it comes from, as Joel will uh, indicate, it needs to come from within, not just um, these outward signs of uh, superficial uh, repentance, but it has to come from the inside. And so, but God says, yet even now, return, okay, return to me, okay. So this, Joel gives us this idea of repentance. And then he tells them some of the fruit, some of the signs, the evidence of repentance. Fasting, weeping, mourning, right? The sort of sorrow over sin. Uh, is there a priority of, of confessing our sin before God? Um, and then uh, who wants to read uh, verse 13? Joel 2, 13. Yeah, uh, let's go to uh, uh, Bryn. Okay, thank you. Okay, so when they used to mourn during this time, and even Jews still do this today, is there it was a uh, tradition of you would tear your garment to show your, your intense sorrow or suffering, and here would be your, your sorrow over sin. Now, it's okay to do that, um, and Jews will still, if you go to a Jewish uh, funeral, especially a religious one, they'll wear some sort of um, outfit where they will cut uh, or tear a little bit of like even their like suit or what you know they're wearing at the funeral. Okay, so to show that they're in mourning. Now they usually just do a little like flap of it, not that much of it. Um, so they don't like rip their shirt off, uh, but... Um, but Joel says here, okay, that's, that's all fine uh, as an outward thing, but he says the more important thing is you need to not tear your garment. You should really what? Tear your heart. Tear your heart. He says really it's, that's what needs to change. Is the Bible's always been about the heart. Moses talks about that. Sin is within the heart. He talks about the need for a new heart, that you, you and I need to repent. We need to circumcise our heart, but ultimately God has to circumcise our heart. Um, and so the prophets will develop that. But Joel says, look, your heart needs to be changed. You know, you need to tear your heart and mourn over sin, not your garment. Uh, and then he says again, now return to Yahweh your God. The good news here is 
God's nature and character relative to repentance. It says he is uh, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and relenting in evil, meaning God is willing to uh, work with repentance. That God is gracious here to forgive. We should repent anyway of our sin, even if God doesn't forgive. We trust uh, that he does because that's what he says. But we should repent anyway because God is right. But God also saves. He also shows grace. He shows love and kindness. Saves who the, his people. Um, and then verse 14. This will be important for Jonah in a minute. Well, I mean, a little bit tomorrow. It says, who knows whether he will... Uh, not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him. Okay, so Jonah um, will basically go, he'll be told to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, and Jonah's supposed to preach, but he preaches an incomplete message, and then he, um, he's going to quote Joel, because when the Ninevites repent, he's going to say, man, I knew it, God, I knew you would do this. I knew that you had this type of character that even though these people deserve judgment, that because you're relenting in judgment, because you're gracious and compassionate, that you would turn away from them in judgment and that if they repented, they would, uh, you would be gracious to them. And Jonah says, I knew it and that's why I didn't want to go. I didn't want that to happen because these are the people who least deserve God's grace. Okay, so that's what Jonah's going to quote Joel, and he's going to say, God, I knew you would do this, and that's why I didn't want to go. Okay, so Joel, uh, Jonah, we may be able to get into a little bit uh, tomorrow. Um, so Jonah's going to extend this a little bit to the, the Gentiles as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so he tells them, like, look, this is what repentance needs to uh, look like. Repentance needs to happen immediately. Is it needs to take top priority. So like when you realize there's sin, you know, it's not like, okay, if you're driving your car, you close your eyes and pray. But it's that it needs to happen right away. Okay, because you, you and I can't guarantee that we'll uh, repent over sin in the future. So he says it needs to be as intense as, um, let me put it this way. Um, you know how, like, when people have young babies, it's hard to, like, harder for them to do as much as they used to do, right? Because the babies have to sleep, they have to be on a schedule, this and that. Then you have to get the, you know, like, getting the baby up is a big, like, pain. So sometimes it's like moms with young babies don't show up to as much stuff, or families with young babies. It's like you got to get the stroller, you got to bring all the stuff, you got to bring food, you got to. Well, okay. Keep that idea in your mind. And then also, um, think about, like, you guys and I have been at weddings, okay? So the, the bride and groom, they've been planning this wedding for a long time. They're with their families, all this stress, all this stuff going on. They finally get married. The uh, wedding day takes a long time. There's a lot of stuff going on. It's fun, and people have a great time. But the bride and groom, once they're gone, they're gone. They're, like, kind of, you know, untouchable. Nobody talks to them. It's like they go off, and they're on their own, Okay. Joel says here, he says, repentance, uh, he says, blow the trumpet in Zion, proclaim a fast, proclaim a solemn assembly, get everybody together to repent. He says, even take out the babies, bring the babies to repent, the nursing mothers, nursing infants, they need to show up to repent, the, um, the, the bride and groom on their wedding night, call them, say, get out here, we need to all repent right now. Okay, so that's what he's saying is like the intensity and the priority of repentance is that there is an urgency to it. Um, I have uh, at certain times like known that I need to confess sin to God, but I'm like, oh, let me do it at the end of the day. Let me get through work. Let me get through school. Let me get through this class. Let me get through this meeting. Let me, you know, put off some, you know, and I put it off and that's not good. And you guys may have done that as well. And God even is gracious even when we don't. Uh, repent perfectly uh, either. But what Joel is saying here is as soon as you're aware of sin, as soon as God convicts us, we need to repent. Okay? Even if there's, even if it's like your wedding night, even if you have your baby is sleeping, he says basically, you know, in the situations where it would be most inconvenient, true repentance is not stopped by that. Yet basically, we would, we would make it a priority if it really mattered to us right? Um, 
It's not like if there's a fire in the house, you're like, I'll just deal with it tomorrow. It's like, no, 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 no. you gotta, <laughs> you gotta deal with it. Uh, you gotta deal with it right now. You know, it's not, uh, it's not fun. It's not pleasant. It's not uh, convenient, but it has to happen right away. Right? So that's um, what he calls them to do. Okay, but then he promises uh, three types of deliverance or restoration. For them, he promises, look, obey me. According to the law, you'll get these blessings. Now, we know most of the time they don't, but this is what he continues uh, to promise. Okay, so he says, you'll get material restoration. God will restore the vine, he'll restore the, uh, the grain. He says that the, uh, the early rain and the late rain will come that makes the, the uh, crops uh, really um, lush and, and prosperous and all these things. And he says, look, God's going to uh, bring this about and he's going to make your, your land uh, prosperous again if you repent. This will happen when Israel repents uh, in the future. Okay, so God does promise uh, this, this goodness to his, uh, his people. But he also promises uh, spiritual restoration. Okay? <clears throat> um, let's read kind of a little bit of an extended passage here, about five verses here, because this gets quoted a couple of times in the New Testament relative to Jesus and the gospel. Okay? Some of uh, us, like if you were going to share the gospel with somebody, like you had an opportunity, like you were going to talk to a bunch of people or you're talking to a friend, you, you and I would hopefully have, you know, not only what the gospel is, but Bible verses that we would tell that person. Maybe you'd think of John 3.16, maybe you'd think of Acts 16.31, maybe you'd think of just, you know, maybe things from Romans, you know, for all of sin, for the wages of sin is death. You know, maybe you'd think of all these different uh, verses. Um, for Peter, when he preaches the gospel on the day that, that the church is starting, Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit, people show up and, and say, well, what's going on here? God's obviously at work. And Peter says, it's because of Jesus who you guys just participated in crucifying. And for Peter, he says, let me tell you what needs to happen now. And he preaches out of the book of Joel. Okay? And for Paul in Romans 10, he quotes the book of Joel. Here, okay. Um, have you guys heard this phrase before? Uh, Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You guys heard that? That's New Testament phrase, um, but it comes from Joel two thirty two. That they're they're using Joel's model, his paradigm of repentance, to promise, hey, look, that God's judgment is still coming. Here's what God expects in repentance. But whoever here's the hope. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Okay. Who wants to read uh, Joel 2, 28 through 32? Joel 2, 28 through 32. Yeah, Patrick. And it shall come to pass afterwards that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young sh uh, men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. And I will show wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. Okay, thank you. So <clears throat> this is the promise of that spiritual restoration of Israel. That that's what Peter calls them to as well in Acts 2. Um, just scroll ahead real quick to Acts uh, 2. I'll show you how Peter uses this text. Peter basically says, he's not saying that the fullness of what, has ha what Joel is talking about has fully happened yet. Okay, that's still in the future. But Peter says, it's starting. This is now starting because... God has poured out his spirit. Jesus has poured out his spirit because of the work that Jesus has accomplished. They're speaking in, in tongues. They're speaking in languages. And he's saying this is a sample of what's coming in the future. He says, now that God has done this, poured out his Holy Spirit, it's time. That's evidence that Jesus is the true Messiah. And you guys need to repent because the day of the Lord now is coming. 
Okay, the day of the Lord is guaranteed because in Joel 2.29, we also get this um, phrase, the last days. This will happen in the last days or the latter days. Okay, he says this, um, uh, it shall be in the last days uh, in uh, Joel 2.29. Okay, now that phrase is really important. Moses talks about that. That's the time of God's eschatological uh, working in the future to save Israel, bring them back to the land, circumcise their heart. Joel uses that. Isaiah uses that. Um, Jacob, when he was promising that the Messiah would come out of Judah, and he talks about he's going to bring a new creation in the last days, in the latter days. Okay? Uh, Daniel will talk about the kingdom of the Lord that will be on the earth in the last days. He talks about this in Daniel 2. Um, the New Testament uses it. So this phrase, the last days or the latter days, is really important. Um, because that's the era that we're in now. That's the era where Jesus has come. The whole, God has uh, poured out his Holy Spirit. That the, the Spirit is now on every believer in a unique way. It dwells, lives inside every believer. And that means that the day of the Lord is now locked in. It's guaranteed. Okay, so he says that's why everybody needs to repent. Um, so like Mormons, they call themselves Latter-day Saints. It's a misnomer. It's a false name. We're the true Latter-day Saints. You're the saints that exist during the period of the last days. Um, Hebrews 1 talks about God has spoken throughout Old Testament history, through the prophets, to the fathers, many portions, many ways over a long period of time. But he says in these last days, this era right now, he's spoken to us in his son, in Jesus. Okay, so Jesus and his work is what defines kind of the beginning of this era called the last days. Okay, and the, this uh, gets concluded by the day of Yahweh, the day of the Lord. Yeah? Yeah. Um, okay, so Peter basically says, they think that Peter and the other disciples who are speaking in tongues, they've heard the wind, the sound like a rushing wind, um, which is the wind is tied with the Holy Spirit. They're seeing these guys speak in languages and dialects, and everybody's hearing them in their own language and dialect. And so this is a miracle. And so, but some of them are saying, you guys are just a bunch of drunks. And they say, well, no, it's too early in the morning for that, is what Peter says. And then he says, it's not that. He says, this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. And then he says, look, God said he would pour out his spirit. He's now done this. You need to repent. But he says here, whoever will call on the name of the Lord will be saved. And then he says um, at the end of his sermon, Acts 2.36, about Jesus, God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So he says, this is what you need to know, that Jesus is the one who has caused this. He's the Messiah. You just participated in killing him. But the message is you need to repent. God used that, raised him from the dead. He's at God's right hand. You need to repent. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, now it's the Lord Jesus, will be saved. So he's actually, Peter is actually calling Jesus the Lord, Yahweh of the Old Testament. Okay? Um, go to Romans uh, chapter 10 real quick. Uh, Romans chapter 10. Okay? Romans 10, 9, you guys have probably heard this verse lots of times. It says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay? Then in Romans uh, 10, 13, Paul quotes Joel 2, 32. He says, for whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So he's putting Jesus, he's saying, Jesus is, it's not only that um, in the Romans were told, basically kind of their pagan Pledge of Allegiance back then was you had to say Caesar was Lord. That was kind of how you, you could have any gods you wanted, but you had to kind of bless the state. You had to kind of bless the, the uh, emperor. And so you had to worship him, offer incense, and say uh, Caesar is Lord. The Christians wouldn't do that. They would say, no, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is the true Caesar. He's really the king of the world. We don't worship anybody else. But it's not only that Jesus is Lord in that sense, but he says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, Yahweh, will be saved. So when Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you're actually confessing that Jesus is God, that Jesus is um, 
Yahweh of the Old Testament. He shares divine identity uh, with God. Okay? Um, so when the Jehovah's Witnesses come knocking on your door and say, uh, Jesus is not Jehovah. Jesus is uh, a God who was created by God, but he's done a lot of stuff for God. Uh, don't go to John 1.1. 1, 1. Go to texts like Romans 10 and, sh- and say, who is um, Romans 10.13 talking about? Whoever calls on the name of Yahweh will be saved. Well, that's Jehovah. That's well, but he applies. Paul applies it here to Jesus, and so what you have to show to Jehovah's Witnesses is uh, not that Jesus is just the word God, but that Jesus is Jehovah Yahweh of the Old Testament, because then their their argument is um, is over. They call themselves Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so if you can show them that Jesus is Jehovah, then they their foundation is is totally gone. Um, Okay, last couple things here as we finish up uh, in the book of Joel. So there's this this hope uh, here of salvation. God also promises to judge the nations and to restore Israel. Okay, so he brings them into this valley around Israel, calls this the valley of decision, meaning basically the valley of God's decided judgment, and he will... uh, bring the nations and uh, and destroy them there and those who have con- who, who have repented of God's people they'll be preserved they'll be saved and then God's kingdom uh, will basically be um, put on you know uh, expressed on earth okay um, let me read uh, just a couple pieces here from uh, Joel 310. You guys may have heard, now I'm going to ruin a, a hymn that we sing in church, okay? Um, have you guys heard a song or a hymn in church that say, let the weak say I am strong, let the poor say I am, okay. That comes from Joel, but it's actually, and the song is okay, it's, it's expressing a truth, but it's actually using the, the, con- the words of Joel out of context. God says here, let the... Um, Basically, listen to this, Joel 3.10. He says, beat your plowshares into swords. Take your farming tools and make weapons. Everybody come to fight God. And then he says, and your pruning hooks into spears. And he says, let the weak man say, I am a mighty man. Let the weak say, I am strong. Okay, so he says, God says, don't only bring your warriors against me. Bring your nerds. Bring your weak people and th- let them all fight God and lose is basically what God is saying here. So the letting the weak say I am strong is not like that they're strong in God. It's actually that here they're opposing God and they're going to lose. Um, but he talks about here that uh, that the, this is uh, the for the day of the Lord is near in 314 in the valley of decision. This is where God's act of judgment against the nations and unrepentant Israel will happen. Then he says in 315, the sun and moon will grow dark. The stars will lose their brightness. Um, Now, we don't look out in the stars and see that happening and say, okay, the day of the Lord must be happening soon. That's not what's intended. That's what will happen when God is uh, judging directly. Um, 216, it, de- it depicts God like a roaring lion. 216 says, Yahweh roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and earth tremble, but Yahweh is a refuge for his people, meaning he's a, a judge against all the earth, but he's a refuge, he's a safe place for his people, and a stronghold to the sons of Israel. <clears throat> Then you will know that I am Yahweh your God, dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain, so Jerusalem will be holy, and strangers will pass through it no more. So he says God's coming, and he's actually at this point going to come and stay with his people. And he's going to be there physically, visibly uh, with his people. Uh, Joel 3.18, he says, In that day the mountains will drip with sweet wine, and the hills will flow with milk, uh, and the brooks of Judah will flow with water, and a spring will go out from the house of Yahweh to, uh, to water the valley of Shittim. Okay, so now new creation happens that's like the Garden of Eden. Okay, at the end here, he talks about that uh, the other places, God's enemies, will be desolate. Last verse, Joel 3.21. God says, uh, it's 3.20. But Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem for all generations. And this is what God says. I will avenge their blood, which I have not avenged, which means God will judge on behalf of his people. Last word of Joel. He says, for Yahweh dwells in Zion. So Obadiah ended with, 
and the kingdom will be Yahweh's after the day of the Lord, Joel ends with Yahweh will dwell in Zion. God's home base, his focal point is going to be, uh, God is going to come and actually manifest his glory there in Zion. Okay, so, uh, and that'll be tied in with uh, the work of the Messiah as well, who will be reigning as the Davidic king in that time. Okay, now, that's Joel, okay? Now, the next book, Jonah, which will be a fun one to get into, and I have a bunch of memes for Jonah, because uh, it has a story, and so, you know, it's, so it's good for memes. Joel, uh, Obadiah says, day of the Lord's coming near on all nations. God's going to judge the whole world. Joel says, uh, God's going to judge you too, Israel, so you better repent. But he's going to come and save his people and judge his enemies. Jonah is going to say, God offers repentance uh, even to the Gentiles. Okay, so that will be, this is a key book, Jonah, that we should be thankful for uh, as well. As If you're a Gentile, meaning a non-Jew and a believer in Jesus, uh, Jonah is a key book for the fact that uh, that we can come to Jesus and be saved without uh, becoming Jews first, okay? So, which was a big deal. People didn't understand that in the first uh, decades of the church. It took a while for them to understand what God was doing and uh, what was going on with that. So Jonah, though, is that God's offer of repentance even extends to, uh, to the Gentiles, um, so we should be, not only be thankful for that, but we should definitely take advantage of that. If you haven't repented of your sins, uh, there's hope, but, uh, but you've got to do it because God's judgment is, is inevitable. Okay, so we've got to end that there.